At Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station, about 300 tons of underground water flows into the reactor buildings each day. Through contact, the water eventually becomes contaminated, and the volume of contaminated water is increasing daily. This contaminated water is next passed through purification equipment. Approximately half of it is used for cooling melted fuel, while the other half is currently being stored in tanks. To deal with the increasing amount of contaminated water, Clean, upstream, underground water is pumped through the groundwater bypass. In parallel with this operation, a landside impermeable wall, or ice wall, is being constructed by means of the frozen soil method, and facilities to pump up groundwater through a subdrain are also being implemented. In addition, taking into account cases where groundwater becomes contaminated, TEPCO is also working on the installation of a seaside impermeable wall to prevent such groundwater from spreading to the sea. Two elements, the seaside impermeable wall and the subdrain, play key roles. Completed ground improvements have dramatically reduced the total amount of radioactive material released from the nuclear power station to the inner port. Moreover, further improvement in the water quality inside the port can be expected as a result of pumping up underground water from a well, known as the groundwater drain, and by closing the seaside impermeable wall to block the groundwater flowing down close to the sea, and by purifying the pumped up groundwater for later discharge. The seaside impermeable wall is a reliable method of preventing marine contamination. This is achieved by installing steel piles side by side under sea. The wall blocks the flow of underground water containing radioactive materials and consequently reduces the amount of radioactive materials flowing to the inner port. The subdrain is a well dug around the reactor buildings to pump up underground water, and it was in use before the accident occurred. By restarting operation of the subdrain to pump up the groundwater around the reactor buildings, the amount of underground water flowing down to the seaside will be reduced, as will a large amount of the water flowing into the reactor buildings. As a result, the subdrain is expected to suppress the generation of contaminated water to a large extent. Underground water is pumped up through the groundwater drain installed near the seaside impermeable wall and through the subdrain near the reactor buildings and is purified to the least possible concentration of radioactive materials via the purification equipment. However, discharge of this water will be carried out only upon obtaining permission from the appropriate ministries, agencies, and fishing industry representatives. Additionally, when the landslide impermeable wall is completed, the course of the underground water currently flowing down to the reactor building area will be significantly diverted in order to direct it into the sea. By progressively implementing a multitude of measures such as this, TEPCO is steadily proceeding with the decommissioning operations, bringing about the improvement of seawater quality and the resolution of water contamination issues. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Fukushima Daiichi has been in the news a lot lately. There's been tank leaks, contaminated groundwater, contaminated Pacific Ocean, and now Tokyo Electric is in the process of trying to remove the nuclear fuel from Daiichi Unit 4. All of these present enormous problems. So I thought I'd use the video today to take you on a guided tour of the site. We'll go up to the tank farm and check it out and then move down and look at each of the units individually because every one of them presents a challenge to Japan. I hope you enjoy the tour. In the center of this drawing is the Fukushima Daiichi 1. and Fukushima Daiichi 2, and then 3, and then 4. 
On the far side of this picture, on the right, are two more cubes, and that's units five and six. We'll talk about them later. As the numbers indicate, Fukushima Daiichi 1 was the first to be built. And all of the problems that are presently happening on that site, as well as all of the problems that happened with the tsunami, were created when they built Fukushima Daiichi 1. And they is not Tokyo Electric. They is an American company called General Electric and another American company called Ebasco. They're the ones that determined how close this power plant is to the water. Now we're going to jump here to another slide of what Daiichi 1 looked like when, um, um, when it was built. And this is only Fukushima Daiichi 1. All of the issues on Daiichi 1 were locked into concrete, the, um, uh, what happened on units 2, 3, and 4 as well. Specifically the grade. If you look back up the road, you'll see a, um, about a 100 foot drop that engineers built a road down to the water. That was actually all dirt. This entire piece was dirt, and those power plants weren't there. They were covered about 100 feet of dirt over top of those power plants. So the decision to put Fukushima Daiichi near the water was made by General Electric and Ibasco. Now, of course, that had effect on the tsunami, and we won't talk about that today. But now, it's a leading cause of the problem with the groundwater. The high area has a lot of groundwater in it. And where is it going? Water flows downhill right into the basement of these power plants. So the decision to cut away the bank that was made in 1965 by General Electric in Abasco is the fundamental problem on this site because it's, um, it's causing the basements to flood. Back in the day, in the 60s, this, there was a large steep drop off to the ocean that was leveled by engineers. Okay, on the far side of this picture on the right is the tank farm. It wasn't there in, in 2011, and it grew dramatically from 2011 to 2012, 2012 to 13. And you can see it's getting pretty darn full. They're going to wind up having to take some of the land in the next farmer's fields over in order to uh, continue to store all this liquid radioactive material. Well, so the tank farm has grown dramatically, and it's on the hill. Of course, the problem is, because it's on the hill, the um, water flows down. And if there's an earthquake, all of these pipes are held together with plastic piping. Not much different than what you've got on a swimming pool. So the plastic pipe will, will, will um, snap, and that water will just run right down that roadway directly into the ocean. The tank in question in this farm is leaking directly into the groundwater. But that's just one tank out of a thousand. And uh, while it's serious enough in itself, it's only problem number one. Problem one, the tank that's leaking. There are other tanks that are leaking too, but the worst one was the one that was identified about three weeks ago. Problem two is that this entire tank farm is not seismically qualified. All right, let's go down and take a look at the power plants along the water, and we'll get to the problems three, four, five. Now remember, these power plants have basements that are essentially below sea level. And the water on the hill, just coming out of the hill as groundwater, had been coming out for 50, 60, 1,000 years. When they built the power plants, they had sump pumps in the basement that pumped that water out so that the basements would stay dry. Well now, of course, the basements are radioactive, so they can't pump it out. So we've got hot radioactive material in these basements, and uh, it's got no place to go except downhill into the Pacific Ocean. The problem number three is not the leaky tank farm. Problem number three is the leaky basements on Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right, let's take a look at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1. Now, it doesn't look like this right now. It's got a, a cocoon over top of it. And the cocoon is made of Kevlar, almost like the kind of uh, shrink wrap you'd put on a boat for the winter. This is, of course, uh, a result of the explosion. It was the smallest unit. It was under 500 megawatts. 
and it exploded first. So mystery number one here is just how much damage happened before the explosion. There's a lot of indications on, on Daiichi 1 that radiation was being released before the explosion and before the tsunami. So it appears that, at least for Daiichi Unit 1, that the earthquake caused some damage. Now in the foreground here is the, uh, is the stack, and Tokyo Electric found cracks in the stack at about 66 meters up. Uh, that's a, a likely a seismic node, and it's quite likely that that stack buckled from the earthquake. So there's a bunch of indications here that Fukushima Daiichi was in trouble from the earthquake, and the tsunami just sealed its fate. Let's move over to Unit 2. Unit 2 looks like it's in the, in the best condition, but it's, uh, it actually had a, probably the most severe containment explosion. Units 1 and 3 and 4 also exploded, but the explosions appear to be outside the containment. The explosion occurred inside the containment, and uh, uh, at the bottom of the uh, reactor, below the grade of the reactor, there's likely a crack in the containment as a result. Now, luckily, the, the side panel of Unit 2 uh, blew out and hydrogen gas was able to escape as opposed to blowing up the box. But that box is not the containment. That box is something called the reactor building, and it's really no stronger than a tin shed you'd buy at Sears. It was designed to um, hold radioactivity in because fans were to pump gases out those tall stacks uh, that you see on the left and right here. Of course, after the accident, the fans failed because they had no electricity. The hydrogen built up and, and blew the sides off of Units 1 and 3. Luckily, Unit 2 it had a blowout panel pop, and the hydrogen gases were able to, uh, to merge with the atmosphere. Unit 2 is a mess inside, but it sure looks okay from the outside. All right, let's go up to Unit 3. Unit 3, of course, is the reactor that had the worst explosion, something called a detonation shockwave compared to something called a deflagration shockwave. We talk about that on the site. Unit 1 had a deflagration shockwave, um, which was nowhere near as damaging. Well, Unit 3 is, um, is a structural mess. Now, it's, it's so badly damaged that they cannot move the nuclear fuel the way they traditionally had planned. The structure just won't handle the extra weight of a, of, a heavy, of a heavy crane put inside it. What they're doing right now on this plan is still removing rubble. And by the way, those cranes that you see in the, in the movies are all being um, moved remotely. The operators are not inside those cranes uh, because the radiation exposures around these buildings are so high. Inside that building, uh, it's essentially a no-man's land. It's inaccessible because radiation levels are so high. Well, what the heck happened in there is, uh, is another mystery. Uh, we, we know a detonation shockwave happened, and um, no nuclear plant in the country can withstand a detonation shockwave. The NRC doesn't want to address that, so here in America, we're, we've solved the problem of detonation shockwaves because we ignore the problem of detonation shockwaves. Uh, but we know, this picture is evidence, that it can happen. Inside that building um, is uh, extraordinary amounts of radiation, but also outside that building, fuel pellets were found in the uh, aftermath of the accident. Now those were bulldozed under, um, but that's an indication of, of a major problem inside the fuel pool. You know, I've been saying all along that I think Unit 3 had something called a prompt moderated criticality in the fuel pool, and that particles of fuel would be found lying outside Unit 3 is an indication that that happened. If the fuel had come from inside the nuclear reactor, it would have had to go through the containment and um, uh, through a very circuitous path. So to my mind, it's very unlikely that um, uh, that fuel would be found outside the reactor. We do know that very high sources were covered up with bulldozers early on after the accident and are likely still there. 
Now, what will I do with Unit 3? Uh, it has fuel in the fuel pool. Eventually, it's going to have to be emptied. But the radiation exposures are so high that, um, that personnel access is really, really limited. My biggest fear on Unit 3 is that the, um, another earthquake will happen. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Richter 9. It can be easily like, like the original one. It could be a, an 8-5 aftershock. But this building has been so damaged that, uh, uh, that it could topple and, uh, and shatter from another significant earthquake. It's being covered up and probably will be completely covered with one of those uh, uh, shrink wrap covers by the winter. But right now it's the only building that's exposed to the atmosphere. Let's go down the road in between the power plants now to Daiichi 4. Now Daiichi 4 wasn't running when the, uh, when the accident happened, but yet it exploded as well. What made Daiichi 4 dangerous was the fact that all of the nuclear fuel wasn't in the containment. All of the nuclear fuel was in the fuel pool. So this, is the, uh, this was the biggest concern of all the experts uh, after the accident. And it's the reason that the, the uh, Americans evacuated out to 50 miles. So even though we had explosions in Unit 1 and Unit 2 and Unit 3, um, that was not the big threat to the population in Japan. There was Daiichi 4. Now, the reason for that is that the fuel was hot, physically hot. And if the fuel pool didn't get enough water, it would have drained, and then you would have had a meltdown inside the fuel pool. And there's nothing between the fuel pool and the sky to keep that radiation in. At least 1, 2, and 3 had containments that may have been leaking, but they hadn't completely failed. So the main issue was, what if Unit 4 runs out of water? Well, you'll recall right after the accident, they brought in pumping trucks to pump water in. And even before that, they tried the helicopters, which was, uh, which was a joke. There was no way a helicopter was going to keep this thing full. Um, but in any event, they were able to pump the water back into that fuel pool. And now um, they got underneath the fuel pool and stabilized it. Uh, this is another indication of a seismic problem on the Daiichi site, because after the... Um, after this building exploded, Tokyo Electric went in and beefed up the floor under this fuel pool. So clearly they had concerns back in April and May, right after the accident, that this plant had a, had a fuel pool that it was in jeopardy of failing. Now this one's all wrapped up in, um, in shrink wrap right now, and they're planning to begin to move nuclear fuel shortly. Now, nuclear fuel is like cigarettes in a pack of cigarettes. And um, if, if the pack is new, you can pull a cigarette out pretty easily. But if the pack is distorted and you pull too hard, you'll snap the cigarette. Same thing can happen inside this fuel pool. If you pull too hard on the nuclear fuel, you can snap the nuclear fuel because the rack has been distorted. The roof fell in on the building. Of course, the rack is distorted. So it wouldn't surprise me that in the course of emptying this fuel pool over the next year, they'll snap a fuel bundle. And you see the stack over there on the, uh, on the right? Well, that's connected now. So they'll pump the gases from inside that envelope up the stack and release them into the air. So it wouldn't surprise me that we'll get airborne uh, Krypton again, Krypton 85, as a result of um, cracked and damaged fuel inside that fuel pool. It happens at nuclear power plants around the country periodically. What normally happens is the fuel pool area is evacuated. All those gases get sucked out and put, pumped up the stack. So keep your eye on Unit 4. I suspect in the future that'll happen. Now we have to pray on Unit 3 and Unit 4 that there's no significant earthquake until those fuel pools are empty. Unit 4 is uh, structurally stronger than Unit 3, but still, it's, uh, it's in jeopardy because it, too, had, um, had the effects of an explosion. There's also a bulge in that blue wall right at the bottom. Um, that blue wall is, is concrete, and the, above it was the, um, what was, the, was the steel building that we talked about that you could buy at Sears. But that blue wall has a buckle in it, and it bows out about a, an inch or two. That's something called the first mode Euler strut buckle, and it's an indication 
of a um, of a structural problem at, uh, caused by the earthquake on Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4. So the buildings along the water, there's a long row of buildings along the water. Those are the turbine buildings. And um, while impressive, there's really not much going on inside them of a nuclear safety standpoint. They do have basements, however, that are flooded with radioactive waste. Out beyond those is, um, is rubble along the water line. And those are where the cooling pumps were that, um, uh, that all failed as a result of the tsunami. That's what was supposed to cool the diesels. And like I said before, if, um, even if the diesels had not been flooded, they would have failed anyway because they could not have been cooled because all of that rubble along the, uh, along the coast. But what Tokyo Electric is now planning to do, because we've got radioactive basements being constantly flooded with something like 400 tons of water every day, is they're going to build a trench all the way around Unit 1, 2, 3, and 4. And they're going to um, pump it full of um, very cold liquids through pipes and freeze it. And this is what's called the ice wall. So an ice wall will go on the, uh, on the land side of the, um, of the buildings that had exploded, and it'll turn the corner, and then it will go down the, uh, the water side of the turbine halls. And hopefully they're going to freeze more than a mile's worth of soil in the process. Now, there's no guarantees that it'll work. It's never been tried before on such a large scale. And even if the wall works, there's no guarantee that it will seal with bedrock. So we still may have uh, leakage in the future with the ice wall. And oh, by the way, it's going to take at least two years before they build that ice wall, which means this thing is going to continue to leak into the Pacific for at least two years. Well, while we're on the subject of the ice wall, um, I want to talk about the, the book I wrote two years ago. This problem of radioactivity in the basements was foreseeable back then. And um, the plant manager at Daiichi saw that there was going to be a problem in April of, uh, during the, uh, right after the accident occurred. So it didn't take a genius to figure out that these basements were going to flood. In the book I wrote, I talked about the need to build a zeolite trench on the high side of these buildings, on the land side of these buildings. And the reason I wanted that was to, not to keep the radioactive material from getting into the ocean, but to keep the clean water from getting into the power plant. Now you can think of these power plant basements as a, as a bathtub. And if, if, um, if you've got the spigot on and the drain closed, uh, what Tokyo Electric is trying to do is build the walls higher as this bathtub begins to fill. Well, my approach isn't to build the walls higher. My approach is to turn the spigot off. The trick here was not to try to prevent the water from getting into the ocean. The trick was to keep the clean water out. That's why the zeolite trench, if it had been built two years ago, would have allowed engineers to go up on the hill and pump clean water right out into the ocean. It would not have been contaminated because the zeolite trench would have prevented that from flowing out. Now it's too late. The groundwater is contaminated, and if you were to suck groundwater up now, you're not sucking clean water up, you're sucking contaminated water up. And uh, we'll see if it works. Last thing I want to talk about on the site today. Uh, remember we started this by saying that the design decisions on Fukushima Daiichi uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 were made by American engineers at GE and Abasco. If we go to the other side of the site, there's Fukushima Daiichi 5 and Fukushima Daiichi 6. They're not in the same location, are they? They're further away from the water, and they're physically higher. So Tokyo Electric recognized that the General Electric decisions on Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4 were wrong. And when they built more reactors on the site after the first four, they were essentially carbon copies of each other, Daiichi 5 and Daiichi 6 were built far enough away from the ocean and high enough, they were another 10 feet higher, that when the tsunami hit, it didn't do anywhere near as much damage. The Abe administration has, has just suggested that they're going to shut five and six down anyway 
And in fact, we are detecting radiation in the basements of 5 and 6. But as far as meltdowns go or hydrogen explosions go, they survived that pretty darn well. Because engineers learned that the decisions on 1, 2, 3, and 4 were wrong, and they built these further back and higher from the ocean. I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the tour. I'll keep you informed. Now, this might sound alarmist to the people who don't know any better, but you have to consider what I'm telling you as the equivalent of a big rock coming through space. And we look for rocks perpetually throughout the last 100 years. We have looked for celestial events, and we are familiar with that. And we now consider that a rock coming from outer space as a real threat if it impacts just one part of our planet. What I think of Fukushima is no different, except it's a really big rock and it's coming at us really fast. And most people have no concept of what nuclear means. Most people are just happy and they're trying to make it through the day and take care of their loved ones or their personal lives and they don't have time to look at the whole picture of what's really happening on our planet and the importance of that and the significance. This is Chernobyl, part of Chernobyl's dump. And all of this equipment you see there was used. The helicopters was over 600 pilots who died trying to dump boric acid and concoctions on Chernobyl's 30% meltdown, melted core. Chernobyl was one third the size of any of the reactors at Fukushima. These people really don't know what they're up against. There's 600,000 of these conscripted, and they were put to war against a machine that has never lost a war. We're fighting an enemy that doesn't know how to lose and that takes over the planet in increments over time. Japan was hit by an earthquake, followed by a tsunami, followed by three meltdowns. Reactor 1, 100% meltdown to a million sievers out in front. 500 sievers can kill you. Unit 2 stayed intact, but it's 100% meltdown, and the fuel pools are melted down, and nobody has ever been inside. Unit 3 is obviously 100% meltdown, and is missing its top six, seven floors. These are 10-story buildings. Unit 4, right alongside of it, in the bottom right-hand corner, was 100%, as you can see, destruction. And its fuel pool, it didn't have any rods in the reactors, but its fuel pool had fires and obviously detonations, and this is very toxic for a very long time. So we have four reactors in heart attack mode. All of these reactors had their basements busted by the earthquake and are filling up with water, and because of the radioactive materials all over those sites, the radioactive water is extremely toxic. It's aerosoled into the environment and hemorrhaging into the ocean. Waste has a very, very long life. And throughout history, we have dumped this stuff into our oceans. And these ships are not carrying just a single barrel. The history of waste and dumping it into our oceans is extraordinary. Now we have Fukushima reactors 1, 2, 3, and 4 releasing toxins into our ocean. And Unit 5 and 6 is also releasing radioactive material into our ocean because they had their backs broken and filled up with radioactive materials. All of these reactors are in trouble, but one, two, three, and four are leaking directly into our ocean. The site is covered in rods and pieces of the rods releasing neutrons and x-rays and splitting atoms. After three years, there was no way to contain this. There was no science on the planet to work on it. And the entire planet is shunned from trying to get in there and find out what's actually happening. It's 400 to 1,000 tons a day hemorrhaging into your ocean. And that's equivalent to St. Paddy's Day every minute. 1,440 minutes a day. Just imagine if that did not dilute for 1,000 years like radiation. And just imagine if that didn't lose its brightness for 1,000 years like radiation. About 1,000 pounds a minute of radioactive dye, at what point does it fill up that ocean? At what point is this going to be a problem? And there is no way to stop this in the near future. The radionuclides are picked up and carried by thousands of miles of rain every day on our ocean. 
Can an ocean sustain that? Absolutely not. And just because you can't see it, just because you can't smell it or pick it up or touch it, doesn't mean what I'm telling you is not so, because you have to get it off the ship because it's so dangerous. Now we have Fukushima hemorrhaging directly into the ocean from three melted cores. And each of these melted cores are three times the size of what they had in Chernobyl. And Unit 3 is MOX fuel at the very top there. This is two million times worse than any other reactor on the planet. So you use 600 pilots and 600,000 soldiers conscripting them and gave them cancers. But you done it in 15 to 20 second increments and then they went home. Canada got busted covering up spikes in Fukushima radiation. They had done a survey right along the coastline and showed evidence of sharp features in the Fukushima plume, the plume over southwestern British Columbia. That's Health Canada talking about this. On the 18th and 19th, they flew along the coastline for 18 hours and they found radioactive materials all around the coastline. And they got called out for it for not telling anybody a couple of years later. It's not just the ocean, it's the animals, it's the little tiny creatures, the flanas, the floras, it's everything on this planet is affected by this radiation that has constantly hemorrhaged out of there. We didn't pay our government to turn their back on us. We didn't pay our government to turn off the radiation detecting, detection networks across North America. We didn't pay our governments to hide this from us. We paid them to go out and make sure that if it happened, we would know about it. And they turned their back on us. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad. Kevin Camps is with us. He is the uh, nuclear waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, beyondnuclear.org. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Tom. We just had a fellow from the Breakthrough Institute telling us how wonderful nuclear power was. Mm. Uh, actually, he was trying to. He, he, we kind of got sidetracked on carbon taxes and my being crazy. But in any case, I understand that, uh, A, the, the guy who is sort of the original hero of Fukushima, who stayed and tried to keep the plant from melting down, just died of cancer. And, yeah. B, that uh, some of the nuclear watchdogs in, in the Fukushima area in Japan are saying that there's just a naked leak of radiation into the ocean. Uh, Take your choice, whichever one you want to talk about first. Well, Yoshida, you know, he did defy Tokyo Electric when they told him to stop cooling the melting down reactors with salt water because they wanted to preserve them for future commercial use, which was insane. They were so in denial. And he disregarded their orders, and he cooled as best he could the reactors with salt water. Unfortunately, he could not stop them from melting down, and, uh, you know, the devil's in the details as to how much radioactivity has gotten out, but that's the latest news that you're saying that's breaking is that, you know, it looks like uh, the New York Times reported just today, based on the Nuclear Regulatory Authority's chief spokesperson, that the leaks have been going on for two years into the ocean from Fukushima. Yikes. Daiichi, and they have surged recently in the last days and weeks to much higher levels, uh, something like a hundred times the level of cesium and strontium and tritium that's been previously seen in the groundwater near the seaside and even in the ocean itself just offshore. Wow. So he admitted they don't know where the leak is occurring. They don't know how to stop it. So, and cesium does what to the human body? Cesium is a muscle seeker, and it has caused, for example, in Ukraine and Belarus and Russia, a condition called Chernobyl heart, even in children, which is holes in the heart congenitally. Okay, and strontium does what to human beings? Strontium is a bone seeker that causes various uh, bone maladies, including in the bone marrow. Including bone cancer and leukemia? Yeah. Okay, and what was the third element you said? Uh, tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen, which is also a clinically proven cause of cancer and birth defects and genetic damage. And this stuff is just literally pouring out of Fukushima right now as we speak. They have uh, like 100 tons or more of leakage into the uh, basement levels of water, groundwater, on a regular basis, and that's where it's picking up its contamination. And then 
leaking apparently into the ocean after that. And that that's the same Pacific Ocean that ends up from Oregon all the way down to Southern California on our side of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, and the uh, ocean currents, even uh, certain forms of uh, you know seafood like tuna, actually bring it over here pretty quickly because they're actually swimming, you know, migrating. So. Uh, you know, it's the bioaccumulation in the food chain that we really need to worry about. Some people might try to dismiss this as not important because the ocean is so big, the radioactivity will dilute, but the bioaccumulation is what reverses that process, and we sit at the top of the food chain. Right. Now, I know, you know, some time back we talked, and you were telling me about efforts, volunteer groups who are putting together monitoring stations, both for air and water, but also uh, looking for things like cesium in, in the fish. Uh, yeah. What's the status of that? Well, the uh, Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network is one of the, the great um, coalitions happening in North America, and they're really uh, urging the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to take this issue seriously, to put official federal monitoring at a much higher alert level on the food that's you know coming from the ocean, that's even being imported from Japan, because our regulations are much weaker than Japan's. Japan allows for... 100, 100 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cesium in food. Beyond that, it's considered unfit for human consumption. Incredibly, in the U.S., the standard is 1,200 becquerels per kilogram. So we Whoa. need to be importing Japanese contaminated food into the United States. Whoa. And is, is this uh, Japanese contaminated food that is too radioactive for Japan, so they're exporting it? You're talking about seafood? Uh, all all food, um, even crops that are being grown, not just in Fukushima Prefecture, but in adjacent prefectures. So, Things like rice? Yes, you name it. I mean, I've uh, checked the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, website from time to time to see the list grow of the various foods that are being contaminated in Japan and at, at certain different levels. Now, this is this is what could be and what the levels are. What is actually being measured? You have, you know, like, uh, you know, hey, this group of, of 15 people in Portland, Oregon, just discovered, you know, in this restaurant, you know, salmon that kicks a Geiger counter at this point. Is there anything like that? I think it's still in the initial stages to try to set up those kind of systems. I mean, it's even been forced on the people of Japan to do their own food analysis because their government, which is in bed with the nuclear industry, isn't doing anywhere near an adequate job. So, for example, there's a family in uh, Kyoto, I'm sorry, in Osaka, that has set up its own food monitoring system. They paid something like 10000 or $15,000 to acquire it from Ukraine, of all places, who have hmm. to deal with the aftermath of Chernobyl. And they are checking the food not only for their own children, but for their children's schoolmates. And so mm -hmm. they've set up kind of a single elementary school covering its own children's food supply. But that's and what are they finding? Well, um, I haven't heard recently, but they are on guard against uh, their children eating any contaminated food above a certain level. Yeah, amazing. And that above the certain level, the, the, that's where the devil's in the details, because there is no safe level of radiation. That's right. Artificial radioactivity is harmful. Very for risk of yeah, cancer. period. No nukes. Beyondnuclear.org is the website. Kevin Camps, the Nuclear Waste Watchdog. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, thank you, Tom. Always great talking to you. If you want more information, get over to beyondnuclear.org. We'll be right back. A team of Japanese researchers is ex expressing concern more than two years after the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. They found high levels of radioactivity in fish almost 100 kilometers from the plant. The scientists caught several Japanese sea bass off Hitachi City that contain levels of radioactive cesium exceeding 1,000 becquerels per kilogram. The amount is more than 10 times the government safety limit. In April 2011, several other fish caught in the same area also contain levels of cesium above 1,000 becquerels. The researchers are trying to find out why fish are still tainted more than two years after the accident. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody.
This week, we learned that the manager of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant, Masao Yoshida, died from cancer. His illness reportedly had nothing to do with the radiation levels at the Fukushima plant that he worked in around the clock alongside a group of men referred to as the Fukushima 50, trying to contain the nuclear crisis in the days and months following the earthquake and tsunami. But, although Mr. Yoshida's cancer can't be traced back to Fukushima, how many others in Japan may contract cancer in the future that can be traced back to Fukushima? On Tuesday, radioactive contamination of groundwater at the plant surged to levels 90 times greater than they were just three days ago. So what effect is the ongoing Fukushima nuclear crisis having in Japan, and what lessons should we be learning in the United States? Kevin Camps is here. He's the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Sam. So let's start in Japan. What's the latest when it comes to Fukushima, when it comes to Japan, in the short term, as far as getting the situation under control, and then in the long term, when it comes to what sort of health effects we might see from, from all these dosages of radiation over the last few years? Well, the best word I can come up with for what's happening in recent days and weeks at Fukushima Daiichi is hemorrhaging of radioactivity. And the scariest part of all is that they don't know where it's coming from. But ultimately, it's coming from three melted-down atomic reactor cores and severely damaged, if not entirely destroyed, radiological containment structures. That's where it's ultimately coming from. But why it's getting out now in such a hurry, all of a sudden, is the big mystery. And this is despite the fact that they have growing tank farms that are stretching now off-site, kind of into the hillsides, holding just countless hundreds and thousands of tons of highly radioactively contaminated water, some of which we know are also leaking. So what it looks like is that this leakage at a faster rate or a slower rate has been going on for over two years at this point. And this really is a, a crisis that the world has never confronted before, this sort of nuclear crisis. I mean, we've had nuclear crisis, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. This one at Fukushima is different. Um, so they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants trying to contain it. And here we are, more than two years past it, and you say we have these tanks now being lined up. How long can this continue to go on? Uh, it seems like an impossible situation. And you know what Tokyo Electric has tried to get away with is convincing the government, the people in the area, the fishermen especially, that releasing some of the contents of those tanks might be an okay thing to do. And they haven't gotten away with it yet, intentionally releasing. But what's going on is unintentional, it's out of control, leakage pathways that they claim not to even know about. How much of the Fukushima disaster was caused, or at least made worse, by the design of the plant itself? And if that's the case, if it was made worse or caused by this, this design, should we in the United States be concerned because we have plants of similar designs? We have 23 identical designs to Fukushima Daiichi in the United States operating, including the oldest reactor in this country, Oyster Creek, New Jersey. We've now seen on live television two years ago what these things are capable of in terms of the explosions and the meltdowns. They knew as early as 1972 at the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission that this design of containment was too small and too weak, and yet they continued to license these things. And we've lived with a game of uh, Russian roulette in terms of the safety risks for 40, dec for 40 years now. These are also building designs that include putting these waste pools at the top of the building, which has proven to be a pretty big problem in the cleanup at Fukushima. That's the other shoe that we hope will never drop, but it's, it's precarious at this point. Unit 4 at Fukushima Daiichi could collapse if there's another big earthquake, and the cooling water in that high-level radioactive waste storage pool could be lost suddenly. Within hours, that waste could be on fire. The situation in the U.S. is that we have uh, multiple times more waste in our pools than is contained in Unit 4, and they are vulnerable to various natural disasters or terrorist attacks or accidental drops of heavy loads that could drain the water away. Or potentially earthquakes and, yes. and other natural disasters. I mean, Fukushima, yeah. that was caused by an earthquake and, and, and a tsunami that came through. Um, how many plants in the United States are in similar precarious situations on fault lines or on coasts or near flood flooding zones. I think we had one, uh, I forgot what state it was last year, that came dangerously close to being flooded. Well, uh, Fort Calhoun in Nebraska has now been shut down for over two years uh, since uh, April of 2011 because of the flooding out there, the damage that was done to the underground facilities. And just like in Japan, 
we are looking at the uh, imminent restart of that reactor despite the damage done. And they don't know how bad it is underground. So in Japan, they're trying to restart reactors despite Fukushima Daiichi. We have dozens, scores of reactors in various vulnerable situations to natural disasters. We did recently move to have reactors shut down at the San Onofre uh, nuclear facility uh, last month. How much of that was, do you think was influenced by what we saw happening in Fukushima, um, if at all? Or is this just kind of a one-off, here we are being careful about nuclear power in this instance while letting all these plants continue un, you know, relatively unchecked in dangerous areas? Well, there has been a groundswell of concern among the American public post-Fukushima, because now folks have seen on live television what American reactor designs are capable of. But I should hasten to say that there are watchdogs in California who have been in the trenches for four decades out there, watchdogging San Onofre. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was not the one who shut down San Onofre. It was the utility itself. The NRC was doing all it could to keep this utility viable. But it was the intervention of groups like Friends of the Earth and grassroots groups who just shined a very bright spotlight on the damage at that facility and showed that it was dangerous to 8 million people if they ever restarted that thing. Uh, in the last 10, 15 seconds, what has Fukushima done for the movement to, for the no nukes movement? Well, I think, you know, the fallout that hit the United States that is still going into the ocean has shown people that the food is contaminated to an extent and uh, people have to be careful what they're eating and people are getting involved on the local level. The nukes in their neighborhood, they're, they're fighting to shut them down. Right. Kevin Camps, the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, thank you so much. Thank you.